Um, just to recap on some of the things that we heard this morning, it, it is about a different approach to developing people. Um, it's not just about the tools, methods and techniques in the workplace. It's about how we select those tools, how we um, encourage people to be critical thinkers about their work. And the role of management is to help develop staff with critical thinking skills. The tools are incidental to that. They're important, but not sufficient. But it's, when you look at all the things that we've been listening to this morning, they sound fantastic, but we all know that's great if your organization has already gone down lane to a great extent. So you can introduce a lot of those things. Otherwise, you're relegated to, to doing it as, as a little hobby in your own department. What I really want to talk about in this session is how do we take organizations that are far from lean? How do we get organizations where we don't have a, a leader at the top who knows everything about lean and says, look, I want it to go lean. It's great if you've got that. But that, those sorts of cases are few and far between. What about the rest of us who think there is an alternative way to drive through the business, but we can't get the senior management attention? We can't get the employee engagement. So where do we start? How do we approach that? And hopefully what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes is actually giving you some approaches that you might think about. One, to get attention. And nothing gets attention like the money. So how do we turn the dream into dollars and cents or pounds and pence? That's, the, that's what really talks. So let's have a look at how we can do some of that. So let's get straight into what are we trying to do. Okay. What I'm trying to illustrate with this slide are two different feelings to the way that a traditional lean organization would feel to a manager, would feel to a leader, would feel to customers. And maybe from this comparison, but how it feels to be in a lean organization and how it feels to be in a mass production organization, what's the difference? And maybe we can start thinking about what are the infrastructures that we really need to start building? Because I'm a great believer in you get the design so you get the behavior you design for. So what are we really designing? Just ask yourself this question. Is your customer experience, there's a big drive for customer experience at the moment. Is it transactional and processed where people go, ow, I just wish I hadn't done that? Or is it relational and personal? Are your staff engaging with your customers in a much more meaningful, deeper conversation, applying critical thinking about their needs and wants, trying to solve their problems? You can see those two paradigms are very, very different. The employee motivation, is it incentivized? You know, it's, I'll pay you more if you keep doing the busy, busy, bang, bang stuff, and you put a, a, an extra bang on the end of that, you'll get more, more dollars. It, is it about that, or is it about a different relationship with the, the staff and the customer where people just want to do stuff? It's great, and actually I'm helping my manager help me deliver service to my customer. We can see that's just a completely different way of being within an organization. And actually it's not zen or mystic as some of this lean stuff starts to become, because we can't quite grab hold of it. This is really hard stuff. The soft stuff is the hard stuff. So, how do we get willing contribution rather than incentivizing all the time? The support operations, and I include middle and higher management within that. You know, are they focused fully on that functional efficiency? Let's go after the costs at all costs. Or are we looking at it end to end? We are actually assigned responsibility where we're looking at how it works all together. Instead of chopping the business up into basically little timeshares that we move our customer around our organization. You know, who wants to timeshare their customers? And the leadership. I don't like the word command and control because I, I think accusing somebody that a command and control manager is almost insulting. I think most senior managers try to direct and control because they don't know any other way. So what Lean allows us to do is to say there is a different way. So let me quickly build that. The top is, systemat uh, um, is, a, is a way of, it's the way that mass protection develops and drives people within that organization. 
employees and customers are very often designed out of that and it's an on-command system go push even the marketing is pushed we we'll create the demand and then we'll process the demand when it comes in as opposed to the lean enterprise where customer pulls pro um, products where employees are understanding the customers needs understanding how their needs are met with the end-to-end -end organization and involved in solving the problems end-to-end -end. so just this picture tells you that all the support mechanisms for this are very different from that. So in order to go lean, we need to get from that to that. Very often what we end up doing is we use lean tools in that environment and we don't get very far. We have to find a way of transition one from the other. And I had this problem with a number of companies that I worked with many years ago before I went to Fujitsu. So I, I needed to find a way that I needed to get attention from the senior management and I needed to get the employees to a position that they could understand not what waste was but what value was. Okay, there's this big focus on waste within lean but we often forget that lean is about delivering value. In services, very often we don't even know what value is let alone what waste is. So I had to create some sort of system that would allow me to articulate this, to get the right behaviours. And I came up with this profile, because the first principle of Lean is to go back to the customer and understand their purpose. What is value in their eyes? And in services, it can be, it can change over the day. So, there are basically four types of demand that come into an organisation that are triggered by either positive or a negative need. Let me explain. There's demand that comes in and the customer says things like, I'd like to go on holiday. I'd like to buy a new computer. I'd like to buy a new car. That's great. Have those processes optimized end-to-end -to, -end to pull those uh, goods and services to that customer. But there's an awful lot of demand, particularly in call centers. Anybody here involved in call centers? Hands up. Okay, you'll understand this. Customers ring up for all sorts of things that, that you think they're not supposed to. But these, I would suggest, are opportunities. So always for opportunity. The customer is saying, do you do A, B, and C? And very often in the calls, they say, no, we do X, Y, and Z and hang up because I need to get on to my sales. But we've just hung up on our future. Our customer is telling us every day what they would like, but just because we don't supply it, we actually dump it. Instead of capturing that and saying, well, you know what, enough people are asking for this, maybe we should do something about this. Everybody says they listen to the voice of the customer, but I've seen so many call centers put the phone down when the customer is talking about those sorts of things. This is a massive opportunity. So we need to identify that and create new processes and products to do it. There is demand that I'm calling Restorative. This means your organization, I was using a product or service that you supplied me and it's gone wrong. Or I asked for an engineer to come out and he didn't. So basically, it's not the same as trying to fix things because it's, it's really difficult to go into an organization that is fixated on fixing things and then go up to people and say, you know, you're not creating value. Because actually, if you are fixing somebody's problems, you sort of are creating value. So I prefer the term to say, look, they've lost the value with whatever they had, but we are restoring it. However, should we allow the situation that the customer would lose that value? Because we're in the process of just responding to our own waste that's caused by other parts of the organization. There's another demand that comes again which again is waste, but it's not waste from your organization, it's waste from somebody else's organization. And if you go into things like um, social services, there's a massive amount of waste comes in on this external, has nothing to do with them, because the hospital have let people go back into the community way before, and social services are picking that up. What I'm trying to do with this is understand frontline staff are starting to understand, yes, I need to respond to some of this, but before I start thinking about optimizing things, I need to think about where's this coming from? What is triggering the work? It's the work triggers we have to find and turn off. So how does this work? Let's just go through some real, and this is a real, a real case. 
This is um, a conferencing company that does webinars and uh, video seminars all online. And sometimes there are hundreds of thousands of people logged in, particularly if a CEO is doing a, a, a worldwide address. You, can, you know, we've all used these sorts of products. When we looked at that, we said, well, how much demand is coming in to your organization? Are you creating value, like setting up conferences? Are you looking for new opportunities? Or are you just responding to problems that your products and services have caused for your customer? This is a real profile. What we've found for this company, that 78% of all demand that was coming in was because the customers were experiencing some difficulty with either getting the conference done or experiencing during that conference. They would then call up the center. Now, these people have been trained in how to, to defuse the situation with lots of empathy training, which is, which is good, but we're empathizing with customers about things that shouldn't actually be happening. Actually, nobody wants this. The customers don't want this, and the organization really shouldn't want it. So what we then said is, well, where's the revenue coming from? And you can see there's the revenue in setting up the conferences. This is money that we're giving back in compensation. Okay. So, the cost is usually in people and systems. Let's attach a cost to processing all of these demands. When we found, well, that's the cost, I've got to get the buttons right, that's the cost for bringing that amount of money in, that's the cost for giving that amount of money away. So, not only have we got the, the cost of the money we're giving away, we're paying to give it away as well. So if you want to look at who is the, which is the most efficient department at giving money away, I think you'll find that these are probably more productive. Now, I'm joking there, okay? <laughs> so, now, if you're a senior manager and you're looking at this, you're probably going to start getting worried. But then we said, well, what's the end-to-end -end performance on this? And, you know, we can see there are no standard processes. It varies because different shifts do different things, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that demand there accounts for three to five million customers every three months. That was designed in. The CEO took one look at this and said, I don't know what to say. I, I got two difficulties. And my colleague, Sue, I think Sue is here somewhere, said, well, what are the difficulties? And he said, well, it's quite simply, we are known, and this is absolutely true, for being the world's number one for customer service. And she said, well, no wonder they're really happy. Our customers are giving them all this money back. You know? And you teach them how to smile over the phone to give that money back. So if I remove that, I might not keep my number one spot for customer service. So, well, that's, but I got another problem. What's that? I just wish you'd come two weeks earlier because I've just signed a check for $4 million to automate with a workflow system this. So, so can you see that that's, that's crazy? So you can see how a very simple process of just scooping up all the data that you've got costing it and saying, this is how much waste, this is the opportunity, and these are, this is where the money is. Okay, so, and it, it, it wasn't just that company, there, there were lots, it gets worse. You know, this is a telecommunications company, a very large company, all right? And you can see 87% of the demand was coming in because there were problems with mobile phones, problems with wires in the road, all of these things. This is abroad, by the way, it's not British for those of you who are squirming from any telecoms companies here. 87% of their F demand coming in was coming because we got problems, 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 and they had a bigger problem. Their customer satisfaction ratings were rock bottom, and there they they, they was churn then to other companies. So basically, we did that cost thing. What was it costing us? But I won't bore, bore you with that, because you see, saw how that works. We did something else with this one. We said, how much, how much of our staff are dealing with 87% of this demand that shouldn't be coming in? 20%. And we said, well, that's rather low. What are the rest doing? And we found out 60% were chasing the 20% who were working on the 87% which shouldn't be coming in. Now, you may laugh, but you are paying for this. Companies that do this pass these costs on to their customers because that 60% is equal to 5,000 people. And people say, we don't have the resources to do lean. You do, they're just doing the wrong work. Let me take you to another case. This is a catalog business. This was one I, I took over many years ago. I won't tell you the name of the company. Um, 
selling from a catalogue, what we found was 66% of the demand that was coming in were the, uh, the products didn't work, they were inaccurately, um, the wrong items were sent, all sorts of issues didn't arrive on time. So 60% of the demand that was coming in. We were only spending 30% of our time working on demand that was actually selling. All right? So taking the frontline staff through, well, this is the goal. We need to remove the waste. Okay, let's stop trying to wow them. Let's take the ow out first, because all of that is ow, ow, ow. Take the ow out before we put the wow in. So we set about doing this, and in just nine months, these profiles changed. Demand from external issues, other suppliers, we removed. 66 went down to 12. You'll never get rid of it all, but that's a huge amount. And then we put the people that were dealing with the complaints to talk to customers and to sell. Our sales tripled. We didn't make anybody redundant. We just took out the waste that allowed us to see the value. And that's what we then started to deliver. And this was a, a gauge. You could see. And the guys that were in the call center saying, well, are we taking this out? How, where's this coming from? It's coming from the merchandising department. Where's this coming from? Oh, it's, it's, it's a stock out. Or it's the way they're actually packing it in the warehouse. They were investigating where this stuff was coming from. So you can see how powerful that, that really is as a guide. Okay? And you can demonstrate to the senior management, you're actually changing the profile of work in your business. You're adding much more value. But it's not enough to just plot that. You have to create the infrastructure around that. Understanding the customer's purpose and what the front line do, they need to be supported by customer management, process management, etc. However, what the team were doing, we're looking at how these support organizations were helping them change that demand profile, helping them reduce the end-to-end -end processing time. And I mean the end-to-end, -end, not just the call center, but into uh, the warehousing and the distribution. Okay, so it's how do, if, if I'm in HR, the question I ask a HR manager, what systems and processes, rewards and recognitions do you need to put in to encourage people to remove waste? They'll certainly be different to the measures you've got today. So this is giving some indications of some direction. Because yes, there is a need to move fast. We live in a real world. We'd like to sit back and, and wait, but we live in a political world. We live in a, a very aggressive world. And the competition is high. So this is going to sound rather technical, but this is one of the, the, the tools that I sit down with people who want to go lean and say, well, let's just talk about what type of change community you have today and what type of change community you want to have tomorrow. Basically, who improves things around here? Okay? And what I have here, and I'm trying to introduce this concept of lean is a workplace approach, which means it's the workforce that does it. Rather than some outside consultants with a trusted advisor push it down or some specialist groups in the central change teams, they are important. Okay? But it's different in a lean world. What we're trying to do is to get the workforce to do a lot more of the change. Okay? So, one of the things you could do when you get home is just to think up all the change initiatives and put it on this graph. And what you'll find is where you don't have lean capability, the only way that you can do it in times of high urgency is aggressive dictatorial. We have to cut um, cost. We have to then merge these different departments, etc., etc. So it it's brutal. And there are times when you have to do that. Okay? You usually have to do that because you don't have a workforce capability that can adapt to change because you've neglected it over a period of time. So let's progress with this. There's uncoordinated dictatorial. There are different initiatives. It's not coordinated, so it creates more confusion. Or you can get it's coordinated, but it's still dictatorial. But you can see it's usually when the urgency is less. Okay. You get point solutions. Again, it's dictatorial when it's high. We get lots of these, what they're called. Um, my friends at Luton uh, 
council talk popcorn projects. Up, oh, there's a panic, it's now a, a project. So there's all of these popcorn things and they all start to go off at the same time. So you'll get all of these point solutions. And again, it's usually a specialist that will do that. A little bit less reactive at point solutions with more of the workforce. And then firefighting, highly reactive out there. Where actually where lean tends to get into an organization, and I'm not recommending this as the only way, but this is the way it normally gets, comes in. You have somebody who's read a book, maybe managing to learn. He does some stuff. So you have these local hobbies going on. So you go, oh, I wish the whole organization could see this. All right. So they start doing things. There's organic learning. But it's still at what I call this unit level. We haven't got into changing the organizational structures. We're just doing what we do a little bit better. So the, 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 the real transformation here, if you're coming up from this loop here, is to get integrated learning structure into your reward and recognition systems, capability systems, your management learning systems, whatever that. That's great, but very often you don't have time to do that. What, if without this, you're only left to do that. Okay? So that's why change is very difficult. If you'd already invested and got this, my hypothesis, because this needs to be tested, is when you get high reactive situations, you will have a workforce capable of responding. I would go so far as to say that if you've already created that capability, you probably won't get as many of the big disasters uh, coming up as you would expect. Now, there are things completely beyond their control. You know, recent events show that. So it's not going to fix all those things, but at least it's creating a workforce that can respond to change. And these sorts of, this sort of thinking works in the private sector and the public sector. And I, I've had permission to show the, this graph next. Oops. There we are. Oops. Just keeping me on my toes. Uh, this is the route map based on investigating the data, having a look at the types of change communities that, that are there. And then saying, well, look, we have to transform our services. And this is um, Luton Borough Council. And basically, they, they started off responding to management pressure to, to do this, go and fix that. Okay? And very soon they realized, look, if we spend our time just fixing the popcorn stuff, we won't do the real work of transformation, which is building this into the organization, its infrastructure. We'll just have these specialists going around fixing everything, and our workforce doesn't learn. So they're now starting to move uh, on this route map here, okay? coming out of basic firefighting activities, being much more planned and reactive, but using the operation rather than specialists with projects, reducing our dependency on projects by getting the operation to start fixing their problems, and then building capability and then building the infrastructure around to support them and as we go on. So we can see we get our dependency. So there isn't one size fits all in this approach. It depends what change capability you currently have. If you've got change capability that's good for top down and some for bottom up, then use it. Don't, you, know, you need to be very pragmatic. So it's about how I could blend all of those. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is from that blend, from that engagement of senior management, from that engagement of customers, and, and most importantly, the staff, we can actually make that transition from what I call make and sell mass production to a sense and respond lean organization. So that's me. Thank you.